The Senate Committee on Government Affairs uh, will come to order. Mr. Secretary, if you could please call the roll. Vice Chair Orenshaw. Senator Gorgachia. Here. Senator Daly. Here. Senator Krasner. Here. Chair Flores. Present. Please let the record reflect all members are present and we have a quorum. Um, we have three items on the agenda. Uh, well, first of all, just housekeeping. I want to remind everybody to please silence your cell phone. If you haven't done so, I am doing so myself. Uh, please, anybody who's going to be testifying, please state your name after each question for the record. Um, if you could provide a, your business card to our committee staff so that they, should they need to contact you for minute purposes, we have it. Um, we limit testimony to two minutes in support, opposition, and neutral. Should your testimony in support, opposition, or neutral exceed two minutes, I'm going to cut you off. For transparency purposes, I say that now. Please don't take that as a sign of disrespect. If you have more you have to get on the record, please provide those written comments to our committee staff. We'll make sure it gets uploaded so that everybody can see it on Nellis. Um, I'm going to take things a little bit of, out of order. I know some folk are trying to get out of here as soon as possible, and I, I, um, I had previously told Assemblywoman Duran that we could start with her bill presentation first. So we'll do uh, uh, Assembly Bill 210 uh, first. Welcome. We'll open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 210. Thank you, Chair and Flores and members of um, the other Senate Government Affairs. I see some, it's a pleasure to see some of my former colleagues from the Assembly. It's good to see you. Thank you. And we are presenting uh, Assembly Bill 210. My name is Assemblywoman B. Duran, excuse me. And today I have with me um, Greg Esposito, Director of Public Relations and Government Affairs with Plumbers and Pipefitters Service Te Technicians, Local 525. Um, we also have a couple of people down in Las Vegas who are also going to co-present, and I believe that is going to be Savannah Palomira, business representative for LU-159 of a DC 16 International Union of Painters and Allied, Allied Trades, and fi finally Christian Cepeda's organizer, uh, LU-159 of DC 16 International Union of Painters and Allied Trades. They will be presenting the bill along with Answering questions that you may have, you may have. Now, with your indulgence, Chair, I would like to turn it over to Mr. Esposito. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Greg Esposito, representing the Nevada State Pipe Trades, truly appreciate your time this afternoon. Um, right now, in the state of Nevada, if a contractor uh, doesn't pay a worker what they are owed, um, and that worker has to go through the process of going to the labor commissioner, filing a complaint, having hearings, submitting evidence and all that such, and the contractor is found to be uh, at fault, you know, have, having uh, violated the worker's rights to get paid, all they have to do is pay them what they owe them. And uh, that's it. That's all the only remedy under the law. They may get ass assessed an administrative penalty from the labor commissioner or um, the, the public body, but for the worker, all they get, even if their pay has been delayed for months or, or longer, is what they wrote in the first place. And um, that's not right. Uh, and uh, there was an article uh, published a few months ago by The Independent uh, explaining a very large case, a very, a very multi-state case, where workers were awarded $1.95 million, not only in wages, but in liquidated damages. Um, because it was a federal case, and on, in federal law, uh, National Labor Relations Act, um, and you cheat a worker, you have to pay them double, you know, have to pay them liquidated damages. And so what this bill is trying to do is bring uh, Nevada law into line with federal law when it comes to that penalty if you underpay, if you intentionally underpay a worker. Uh, one of the byproducts of the, of the uh, result of that uh, was that that contractor now has to be very clear um, with what the, what the worker is supposed to be earning while on the job. And so there are two parts to this bill. Uh, the second part addresses the first thing that I said, where if you intentionally, willfully, and repeatedly cheat a worker, um, you know, you have to pay them 
uh, double what you owe them. But then the first part uh, is where a contractor is responsible for notifying the worker what the prevailing wages are. Um, I'll come back to the specific language, but I'd like to turn it over to my co-presenters down in Las Vegas because they were directly involved in uh, that um, issue, that multi-state issue, uh, and they have some compelling testimony to offer. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Christian Cespedes. I'm an organizer for Local 159, District 16, out of the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades. Thank you for listening to my personal experiences and highlighting the importance of our labor laws and worker rights. It is unfortunate that some of the employers try to take advantage of their workers and violate the laws and avoid paying over time of fair wages. But my experience is not unique. Many workers face similar challenges. I remember working on city projects where the company I worked for would manipulate the project schedules and make us show up after 10 a.m. so the city inspector wouldn't take our names. We work long hours, sometimes 12, 14 hour days without being paid overtime. It was frustrating and ex exhausting, and I felt like it was never going to an end. This experience was unforgettable, but all it took was one public project for me to learn about my rights. It is not fair for any contractors to exploit their workers in this manner. It is vital for contractors to understand and respect the labor laws and provide their empl employees with fair compensation for the work and information. Now that I am an organizer, I speak with workers to educate them on their rights. It is sad that a lot of them, they don't even know their rights or they don't know what they're supposed to get paid. But having these laws can be the foundation of education for many workers that need help. We need to raise awareness about our labor laws and worker rights. We need to ensure that employers comply with the labor laws and that there are strict penalties for those who violate them. Workers need to, feel, need to feel empowered to speak up and report any violations to any appropriate authorities without fear of retaliation. In conclusion, I hope my experience sheds a light on the importance of fair comp compensation and labor laws. As a community, we need to stand together and demand that employees, employers treat their workers with respect and fairness they deserve. Thank you. Good afternoon to the chair and to the members of the committee. My name is Savannah Palmyra, and I am a business representative for Local Union 159, District Council 16 of the IUPAT. I'm a native of this great state and a native of Las Vegas, so it's my honor to be able to speak to you this afternoon. In 2019, I started running into a painting contractor in Las Vegas all over town. The first place I discovered this company was on a Clark County School District project, a prevailing wage project at Griffith Elementary School. When I started to speak to the workers, it was quickly evident to myself that something terrible was happening. I heard from several workers who told me a version of the same story. This company does not pay overtime. This company had over 400 workers, 400 plus workers scattered throughout our state and neighboring states, all working more than 40 hours a week and not being compensated properly by law. Even during an active Department of Labor investigation, this company was continuing to bid on public work projects in Southern Nevada. I am happy to report that after nearly three years of the Fair Labor Standard Act violation investigation, these workers will be awarded approximately $1.9 million. They will also be awarded 100% in liquidated damages, totaling over $3.5 million. Let me explain one story as to why this is so important for workers. One of these workers who worked for that company, him and his wife start over again. How many other workers in this state have the similar story? How many on prevailing wage projects have similar stories? And how much does that cost workers? And how much does that cost the state of Nevada? 
This company that we've been talking about does a ton more work in the private sector than in the public sector. But the fact that the company bid and performed work on any prevailing wage project should be of great concern to the state. This is not only a company in town, this is not the only company in town that have made these violations. The state of Nevada should pass AB 210 to protect the integrity of our public works projects, our taxpayer dollars, and the hard working labor of our, Nevada, our, of our Nevadans. Thank you for your time today, and I ask you for your support in AB 210. Greg Esposito for the record. Um, to briefly go over what's on paper here, uh, I want you to notice in, in the re first revision, sections two, three, four, and five have been deleted by amendment uh, because after the first hearing, uh, we, we did what we could to work as best as we could uh, with uh, people who had opposed the bill. And this, is, this bill, I feel, is better because of it. Uh, they had very good concerns about the language that had come out of LCB, and so what you're, you know, this section 5.5 .5 is a simplification of what the intent is, um, where a contractor engaged in a public work uh, has to um, provide their workers the website to the labor commissioner's um, prevailing wage rate. Uh, it's about a 30-page document, so providing the whole document would be completely impractical. But as long as they provide the website and then get confirmation from the worker that the website has been provided, then they, uh, um, then they meet the statute's requirements. And then, as I said, the second part, um, the word, we added the words uh, willfully and repeatedly because our objective is not to um, penalize the contractors who make an honest mistake. Uh, usually those, those things don't go to hearings anyway, but if you just make an honest mistake and, uh, you know, a little bit here and a little bit there, that's not who we're looking for. We're, we're looking for the contractors like Savannah uh, talked about, the willful violators. Um, we look forward to continuing to work with people. Uh, this is about as clean as I can think it gets uh, as far as our intentions. Um, and uh, I believe the Labor Commissioner, uh, Brett Harris, is, in the, um, is at Grant Sawyer right now. And so if you have any questions specific to Labor Commissioner's office, um, you might want to ask her because uh, she knows far better than I do. Uh, with that, I look forward to any questions you may have. And thank you, all four of you, for your presentation. Members, any questions? Uh, Vice Chair, please. Uh, th thank you very much, Chair. And uh, thank you, Assemblywoman, for bringing the bill. I think my question is either, either for Assemblywoman Duran or Mr. Esposito. So under the current state of law right now, if there's no penalty, I mean, are you finding that there's not much incentive for when, when there is an employer who's not taking care of the employee's wages for them to try to get it right the first time? I mean, do you think that if this passes, you'll have more employers trying to make sure that it is get, they're getting it right the first time and folks aren't being shorted their, their rightful wages? Greg Esposito, for the record, I'm certain that the vast majority of contractors in this, um, in this state do the right thing and they pay the right wages. However, I think I was uh, visiting with a Senator Krasner who pointed out, wait a second, if there's no penalty and all you have to do is do what you're supposed to do in the first time, why wouldn't an unscrupulous contractor cheat their worker, right? Like, why not? Let's, let's try and see what we can get away with. I'm sure that that is a vast minority, um, but it does still happen. And yes, we're hoping that if you're facing down having to double up on the wages, uh, you're gonna be a little disincentivized to cheat. Thank you, Mr. Esposito. Thank you, Assemblywoman Duran, for bringing the bill. Thanks, Chair. Members, any additional questions? Senator Goykachia, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But as I look at that additional section, it says shall require a person found to have willfully and repeatedly. So, again, this is not going to be just a simple error. It will be a case of uh, they've, they've, continued, they've practiced this practice. How's that? Yeah, and I, Greg Esposito, for the record, I want to be very clear. Um, I, I, having conversations with the Labor Commissioner, they only go after our actors that aren't willing to make it right the first time. I, from what I understand the process, let's just say the city of Las Vegas sees that you had a discrepancy, they'll ask the contractor to fix it first. And it, if the contractor fixes it, I don't think it ever gets the Labor Commissioner. So, yeah, this is, this is when you're really being a bad actor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Perfect. Uh, with that, I'd like to invite you to sit back. And I'd like to invite those wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 210 to please come forward either in Carson City or Las Vegas. 
I see some folk in Las Vegas, but we'll start here in Carson City and then we'll go, go to Las Vegas. Thank you, Chair Flores and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Susie Martinez, and I am the Executive Secretary Treasurer of the Nevada State AFL-CIO. And with over 150,000 members and 120 unions, we are in full support of SB 210. Thank you very much. And thank you. Please. For the record, my name is Mark Ellis. I'm the President of Communication Workers of America, and we strongly support this bill. And thank you for joining us. Uh, we will go to Las Vegas, and then we'll come right back to Carson. Uh, for the record, my name is Daniel Lincoln, business representative of Glazers Local 2001, and we are in support of this bill. Thank you for joining us. We'll come back to Carson City, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Fran Almarez. I represent the Teamsters, um, and we are in full support of this bill because there are contractors out there who are not paying our people overtime. And thank you. And thank you for joining us, please. Thank you for the record, Ross Kinson uh, for the Northern Nevada Central Labor Council, and we are in full support of this bill. And thank you for joining us. Anybody else in Las Vegas or Carson City? Seeing none. BPS will go to the phone. Anyone wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 210? If you would like to testify in support of AB 210, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue or raise your hand in a Zoom window. Good afternoon, Chairman Flores and the members of the committee. For the record, my name is John Klug, D-I-O-N-N-E-K-L-U-G. I am with the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, Local 711 out of Las Vegas, and we strongly support um, the AB 210 bill. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Next caller in support of Assembly Bill 210. Good afternoon, Chairman Flores and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Mike McGovern. Um, I strongly urge the committee to support Assembly Bill 210. I'm a member of the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, and really hope that you guys can close this loophole that isn't letting people get paid correctly. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Next caller in support. Good afternoon, Chairman. Good afternoon, Chairman, Flore, Chairman Flores and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Robert Sumlin, S -U, Robert, R O B E R T S U M L I N. I'm with the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, Local Lodge SC711, Las Vegas, Nevada. I strongly urge the committee to support Assembly Bill 210. Thank you. Thank you. BPS, we have anybody else on the phone? The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. BPS will go to those wishing to testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 210 over the phone. If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 210, please press star, not, star 9 now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. We'll go to Las Vegas and Carson City. Opposition to Assembly Bill 210. Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Alexis Motorex with the Nevada Chapter Associated General Contractors, representing both signatory and open shop contractors in the commercial construction industry in Northern Nevada. We are here today in opposition of AB 210 because of the language in Section 5.5. We are agreeable to the language in Section 6 and support efforts to punish those who willfully cheat their employees. While we appreciate the efforts of the proponents of this bill to address our concerns in Section 5.5 and the concessions they have already made, we remain opposed. It is our belief that this is simply unnecessary and places an unfair burden on employers to fix a problem that does not exist. 
The bill states that a contractor engaged in a public work must provide to his or her workers assigned to the public work written or electronic notice of the Labor Commissioner's website and the contractor's name and address and a receipt of each employer's, from each employee receiving that information. Our members engage on several public work projects in the span of a year and dispatch their employees as needed to any, of, any number of them. Our reading of this would require a contractor to provide this information and maintain a record of it each time an employee is assigned to a public work. This would result in hundreds of records needing to be kept, maintained, and made available to the Labor Commissioner for each employer, employee. While reprehensible, employers cheating their employees on pub, out of wages on public works projects is rare, and there are already provisions in law to ensure the employees made whole and to penalize the contractor, would in, which could include a debarment. Members of the AGC have always supported prevailing wage and efforts to penalize bad actors, which is what Section 6 does. But Section 5.5 is a solution to a problem that is not widespread. It should not be the policy of the state to enact laws that will make it more expensive and burdensome for good actors who do work in the state and provide well-paying jobs for Nevadans that will not result in any positive change. We have stated that we would be amenable to having posters at offices and job sites with the Labor Commissioner's website so employees know where to look for existing prevailing wage rates, but we are adamantly opposed to any record keeping requirement. Thank you for your time and consideration of our position. And thank you for joining us, please. Hi, my name is Sarah Collins and I'm with the National Electrical Contractors Association of Northern Nevada. Um, we appreciate being at the table with all the stakeholder meetings, however, we are still in opposition to the bill. That's all. And thank you for joining us, please. Chair and members of the committee, Jessica Ferrado here today on behalf of Granite Construction. Granite is a union contractor that has been operating in Nevada for 40 years. We employ over 100 um, employees throughout the state. We still um, have concerns in section 5.5 and want to echo the comments of AGC. We believe that that section um, is overburdensome and duplicative. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Anybody else wishing to testify in opposition? Seeing none, BPS, do we have anybody wishing to testify in the neutral position? If you would like to testify in neutral for AB 210, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. And we'll go to Las Vegas. Good afternoon, Brett Harris, Labor Commissioner, for the record. We do have a question for you. I, 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 I knew that it was going to happen at least once. I, you're always there, so now it, it was actually not in vain. Senator Daly, please. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, <clears throat> so I'm just trying to get some clarification on the Section 1. Point, or 5.5, excuse me, and we have dueling interpretations, and we may ask legal in a minute to maybe help clarify for that. So what is the current provisions? I know there's uh, provisions in uh, either administrative code or in the statute regarding posting what the prevailing wage rate is on every job site. And the way I see this is we're just trying to make sure that each individual person gets as much information because I've been to job sites. Some of them are very big. There, there's noise, uh, various things. They don't know where to look. Nobody's ever looking at those disclosures that are posted all over the place. So um, anyway, what's the current rule on that? Thank you, Brett Harris, Nevada Labor Commissioner, for the record. Uh, all that information is available and posted on our website. Um, in terms of the contractor's duty to spread that information, I'm not off the top of my head aware of a regulation, um, but I would want to do a full review before I commit to that answer. And I appreciate that. I, I I was thinking that it is. I know there's a requirement for federal uh, to post the federal prevailing wage, and you see that on the disclosures about discrimination, various things. They're all on one board somewhere, and uh, so so a lot of that stuff is posted. Um, but I don't think workers are getting to it. So I think that's where they're trying to get to with this: is how do we get that information uh, to someone? Um, in your view, or look at the at the rule. Um, that they're proposing, is that going to be much of a burden or, uh, you know, you're going to look at the information. If somebody obviously has a wage claim, you take care of that separately, but uh, I don't know if this notice really makes that much difference to your office. 
Brett Harris, Nevada Labor Commissioner, for the record. Um, I would agree with you, Senator Daly. I, I, in terms of what our office would have to do uh, for Section 5.5, I don't think it changes anything. Follow, please. No, no, no follow up. Thank, thank you, Labor Commissioner. Maybe if we can get legal to give us the interpretation, because we have the one from AGC that is claiming that we'd have to do it for every worker on every job, and sometimes workers go to multiple jobs in one day uh, versus the sponsor's interpretation that says, hey, look, they really only need to get it once, and you can do that at the time of, that a person's being hired. So which, does the language support one version over the other, or is it unclear still? And Brett Harris, Nevada Labor Commissioner, for the record, I just wanted to clarify my answer that I don't think Section 5.5 .5 requires the Office of the Labor Commissioner to do anything additional. I do see that it obviously requires the contractors to do something additional. So the way that I read this is that it, they would have to do it on a, each public work project. For the record, this is Heidi Clarson with the Legal Division of the Legislative Council Bureau. Sorry, uh, it looks to me like NRS 338020 does have a requirement that um, the hourly and daily rate of wages must be posted on the site of the public work in a place generally visible to the workers. Um, I'm not uh, sure if there is anything more specific in the regulations. I would have to take a look at that. I, I think we're Section 5.5 um, is different uh, substantively is that this requires the contractor to um, talk to sort of each individual worker and get the uh, written or electronic acknowledgement of receipt. So it, it goes above and beyond, I think, what is currently required that they just generally be posted um, at the site of the public work. Senator Daly, please. Thank you. In, in regard to the, the interpretation, and we have Mr. Esposito there, maybe you can answer what their intent is, is that Basically, the contractor needs to notify his worker. He can meet the requirement, at least the way you understand it, and your intent when they hire the person. He may or may not go on a public work. He may go on one later. He may go to several in the course of his employment with this employer. But if the employer has this on record uh, when they hired him, that they provided this information in the notice, um, then they should be okay. Is that your intent? Greg Esposito, for the record, uh, thank you, Senator Daly, for the question. Uh, yes, um, you know, uh, reading Section 5.5, I, I, cr I created just a very rudimentary mock-up of a possible, pe possible new hire onboarding document. Um, I think I provided it to the committee. Uh, it has the contractor's name, the contractor's address. It has the employee's name. It has some pretty standard language that says, as you'll find on almost any new hire packet, I've received the you know, XYZ Construction Employee Handbook. I've received the XYZ Construction Safety Manual. I've received the 2023 prevailing wage rates for Clark County, Nevada, and then signature and date. Those, those simple things, this little half page right here, uh, satisfies the requirements um, that are in 5.5. And uh, on, on the piece of paper is the full website, on the piece of paper is a tiny URL you can create, and on the, web, on the piece of paper is a QR code that somebody can scan and have the prevailing wage rates on their phone. All right. um, more specifically to your point, the first sentence reads, a contractor engaged on a public work shall provide to his or her workers assigned to the public work a written or electronic notice. Okay, so if you, if you fill it, let's just say in January you hire somebody and they're going to a public work and you have them fill this out, and then in June, you send them to another public work. This is still filled out. I mean, this still exists. It doesn't get erased because they left that public work. The contractor would still have this on file, and they would have already provided the wage rates to that worker. And so I, and I appreciate uh, Ms. Monterex. Uh, she's been far more patient with me than I've, I've been. I apologize for my being bullheaded on this one, so I apologize on, on record on that one. Um, but I, I just don't see it. The true intent is to just make sure the employee knows what they're supposed to be making on that job. And if you do it once and you have them, you know, on your onboarding paperwork, see it once, 
and sign it once, it doesn't get unsigned. The only time you'd have to do it again is when the prevailing rates, rates change, and I'll, I'll admit that. So this is the 23 rates. When they change in 25, yeah, you're gonna have to notify the workers on those public works projects again. But that's what you should be doing anyway, because the wage rates change. So yes, the true intent is just make sure they're notified once, and unless the wage rates change, you don't have to notify them again. And thank you, Mr. Chair. And so I understand that. And I know that last part about the updating and all that kind of stuff isn't really clear in here. And that's where I think some of the confusions coming in between the, the, the two parties. Because I was going to also say, all right, so for me, in my personal experience, I mean, I went to work for a contractor, worked for that guy for the next 10 years, right? Went to many different public works jobs over a decade, uh, and the wage rates changed and various things. Um, so that's where I'm trying to get down to the clear part is how often do they have to be notified? Could it be a an annual thing, right, at hire and in an annual? I mean, because the wages aren't going to change. They usually only change once a year uh, on the prevailing wage. Uh, and then, of course, if you're sending them to the website, all of the county rates and various things, northern Nevada here, I know people are coming from Reno to Carson City, Carson City to Story, you know, so they can go in two different counties or three in one day sometimes. Um, so it wouldn't be just one, a single county, but all of the information for all counties or regions are on the Labor Commissioner's website. So if they're getting the website, they should be able to look that information up. I'm just trying to figure out what is the burden, how often does a contractor have to actually do it, and do the words support the intent, and, and I think there st still appears to be some confusion. Uh, so uh, hoping to, I was just hoping to try to clear some stuff up, so. And I appreciate that. May I please respond? Uh, Greg Esposito, for the record. Thank you, Senator, for those statements. Um, yeah, if you look under subsection A, it says where the prevailing rates for the public work are posted. So yes, if you go to another job site where it is a different prevailing wage rate, then yes, I will fully admit that the contractor would have to either do this again or instead of having one QR code on this single piece of paper that says 23 Clark County, it would say another QR code that would say 23 Rural South, if I remember my classifications correctly. They will still have shown, they'll still be able to show that this one piece of paper provided all the information that's required by law. And I understand that uh, some of the people who came up uh, feel that it's overburdensome was the word used. I don't see how this piece of paper is overburdensome compared to the amount of hours the Labor Commissioner has to investigate when somebody comes forward because they didn't know what they were supposed to be making in the first place. A contractor knowing that they've given their people the wage rate, they may know what they're supposed to be making, is going to be another deterrent, like Senator Orange asked, another deterrent to not cheat because, well, heck, I mean, they know what they're supposed to be making on this job. How do I cheat them, right? And I, I can't imagine that it's not going to decrease how many investigations have to get done. Um, one, one final thing, if I may, um, a, a problem that doesn't exist uh, was, was mentioned. Um, I, I believe the testimony from Christian down south, the problem does exist. And this guy, somebody right there who was disenfranchised for years, um, and it was on public works projects. He said it himself, there's quite a bit that was private. But from, from my research, uh, there have been 102 cases over the past two years on public works projects that the Labor Commissioner had to do an investigation, if, if my research is correct. So that's not a, not, that's not a non problem. There's a hun at least 102 people who had a fight for what was theirs in the first place on public works. So I appreciate the, the questions and comments. Thank you. And thank you for the presentation, Assemblywoman. Thank you as well. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and, oh, I'm sorry, Senator Krasner. Thank you, Chair. I apologize. I wasn't loud enough. And I'm not sure if my question is for you, Mr. Eposito, or for the Labor Commissioner, but is there a, a current remedy? And if so, what is it for a worker who is repeatedly and willfully not being paid their wages by their employer? What is there something currently? What, what does a worker do?
Brett Harris, Nevada Labor Commissioner, for the record. So um, right now the remedies for not paying, paying uh, prevailing wage directly for the worker are just that uh, we make sure the difference in the wage is paid to the worker. In terms of additional penalties, the Office of the Labor Commissioner can assess up to $5,000 administrative penalty. Um, having an administrative penalty assessed against you on a uh, public, can you hear me okay? Or, yes, we can. Yes, that's not my question though. I'm, I'm just telling you what the penalties are for violation of prevailing wage. So there's directly for the worker, the, this, the premise of this bill is correct. So right now, the only thing that goes directly to the worker is the difference in the wages. But there are additional penalties that can be assessed. They just don't go to the benefit of the worker. Thank you. That's not my question. My question is, what is the remedy for the worker? Does What does the worker do? Do they s jump up and down? Do they go to court? Do they file a lawsuit? How do they get paid if this is happening? Brett Harris, Nevada Labor Commissioner, for the record. So we take these types of cases by complaint. We normally get the complaint either from a third party or the awarding body on the project. Thank you. Senator, uh, may I, Greg Esposito for the record. Senator, there's a complaint form on the Labor Commissioner's website. So, so a worker needs to know that there is a Labor Commissioner. They need to know the Labor Commissioner has a website. Then they need to find the complaint form on the Labor Commissioner's website. They need to fill it out as to what the complaint is, where they've been cheated. And then the Labor Commissioner will have an investigator. I think there are five for the whole state, maybe six, um, that will then contact that worker to collect information then that investigator will go to the contractor and get the contractor's side of the story. And if necessary, then there will be a hearing. Um, so that's the process for a worker to be made whole if they've been cheated. Just so really quick, how long does that process generally take? I, I've been, uh, Greg Esposito for the record to the Senator, um, I've been involved in processes that have taken four months. Vice Chair, please. Thank you very much. And my question for the Labor Commissioner, Mr. Esposito mentioned in his research 102 cases of workers on prevailing wage projects who had not been paid their, their proper wages. Is that number sound correct to you in terms of the kind of cases and complaints you've seen as our Labor Commissioner? And I'm just kind of also wondering if you could tell us how those things that you've seen be resolved, have they resolved quickly, what the timelines have been in terms of trying to get the employees the wages they were owed? Brett Harris, Nevada Labor Commissioner, for the record. So that is an accurate number of prevailing wage specific claims uh, out of chapter 338. So that's for the, uh, we ran a report of the previous two years. Um, it's been 102 claims regarding prevailing wage. So that can be not paying the right misclassification and underpaying, not paying overtime of prevailing wage or not paying prevailing wage. So there are a couple of subcategories of claim under that. Um, and I'm sorry, can you repeat the second part of your question? Uh, what is, in your experience, the timeline in terms of trying to get those workers the wages that were owed them, what, how, how quickly have you seen it um, get resolved? Brett Harris, Nevada Labor Commissioner, for the record. So the procedural statute, um, these cases are a little bit different than our general 608 wage claims because they can be initiated by a third party or by the awarding body. And then it's actually the awarding body that does the initial investigation. They are given 30 days to do that, submit a determination, and then the uh, contractor or respondent is given a time period to respond. Once that occurs, our office audits the investigation and findings from the awarding body, and we reduce that if there's if there's reason to go to hearing, we go to hearing. If not, we reduce that to a final order. So it really can depend. Um, what does happen in a lot of these cases, as Mr. Esposito said, is when it's a difference of wages, and it's just a matter of the contractor not knowing. They normally get paid in that time period, which is why the statutes even specify that our final orders in these types of cases don't have to assess the difference if it's already been paid. 
Th thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. And thank you. With that, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing and appreciate it, Assemblywoman. And offline, the committee will continue to work uh, with some of the concerns raised by the opposition and ensure that we get the best clear intent and capture the bill. I'm sure we'll be fine. Um, uh, next, I'd like to open up the hearing. Uh, I don't see Assemblywoman Anderson, but I do see our assembly member here. So we'll open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 177. And if we could just let Assemblywoman Anderson know that um, she should be joining us here shor shortly. Good afternoon, Chairman uh, Flores and uh, Vice Chair Ornshell and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Bert Gurr. Uh, I'm an assemblyman for the most diverse and beautiful district in the state, District 33. Uh, I'm here today and I thank you for allowing us to be here today to present AB 177. With me is James Wingate. Of, uh, he's the Executive Director of USA North. Uh, to help present the bill and answer any questions you may have that I can't do, which could be a lot. To put it simply, AB 177 is a bill which authorizes parcel data sharing to enhance safety for Nevadans. To understand how AB 177 will enhance the public safety, I'd like to provide a brief overview of Chapter 455 of the Nevada Revised Statutes, which deals with excavation near subsurface installation, subsurface. I said that right, installations. NRS defines subsurface installations to include things such as pipelines, conduit, cable, and sewer lines, to name a few. NRS also sets forth Nevada's call before you dig law, which is designed to protect underground facilities from excavation, which includes boring, drilling, and trenching, among others. State law defines operator as any person who owns, operates, or maintains a subsurface installation with the exception of the Nevada Department of Transportation. There are 205 operators within Nevada, ranging from utility companies to water and sewer districts to general improvement di districts. Every county, city, and town in Nevada is also an operator. Nevada's call before you dig law prohibits operators from beginning an excavation or demolition without first providing notice of the location of the work at least two day working days, but not more than 28 calendar days prior to the scheduled work date. The notice must be given to an association for operators, which is defined as an organization that receives notifications pursuant to subsection 1 of NRS 455.110 and transmits such notifications to its members. In Nevada, both residents and operators are required to call 811 at least two working days before digging in the ground. That call goes to the Underground Service Alert of Northern California and Nevada, commonly known as USA North 811. USA North then notifies its members of the location of the excavation and the operators with underground facilities in the area locate the area of their facilities and mark them with items such as paint, <coughs> flags, and stakes. The color of the markers indicates what type of infrastructure is below. For example, electric is red, water is blue, and natural gas is yellow. So you can see those markings along the front of your house, you know what's, what, what's underground there. The proactive marking process is designed to avoid excavation, it, it, it's designed to avoid excavation damaging underground infrastructure. With that background, I'll walk you through AB 177. Existing law requires each county assessor to annually provide the Nevada State Demographer with a parcel data set, which the demographer is to keep confidential. Section 1 of AB 177 authorizes the demographer to provide the data set to an association of operators, which in Nevada is USA North. That change is made in a number of places throughout NRS for consistency, and paragraph 9 cross-references an association of operators with its definition in NRS and specifically mentions the Underground Service Alert in Northern California and Nevada or its successor organization. <clears throat> By authorizing the state demographer to provide the parcel data set, 
Uh, USA North will have the most accurate parcel description available to aid its member operators in locating underground facilities prior to evacuation or <laughs> excavation. The state, <laughs> yeah, evacuation. <laughs> the state's parcel data set is more accurate than commercially available parcel data. To give you an idea of the importance of parcel data accuracy, Nevada's 205 operators, 205 operators collected, collectively processed more than 193,000 line locate last requests last year, with more than 131,000 of those in Clark County alone. That's a lot of digging. <coughs> and with that, if, Mr. Wingate, if you've got something you'd like to add. Good afternoon, Chair Flores and members of the committee. My name is James Wingate. I'm from USA North 811, as Assemblyman Gurr mentioned. Um, underground utilities facilitate this meeting, right? We're talking to people in, in Las Vegas right now. We have heat, light, warmth, water, sewer, everything in this building. It is underground utilities facilitate our modern way of life. And so um, those that underground infrastructure is not at risk from not as greatly at risk from terrorism or things like that as it is from our own citizens and excavators accidentally damaging underground utilities. Um, hap happens hundreds of thousands of times across the nation. Nevada is actually one of the leaders in the nation as far as the ratio of damages uh, compared to how much excavation activity there is thanks to the outstanding efforts of the Public Utilities Commission of Nevada and the excavating community and utility operators. But this bill will help us at the call center to dispatch the correct utility operators to the correct location uh, more accurately, uh, as well as help the utility owners um, know where the digging is going to take place. If, uh, for those of you who are from Clark County, is a perfect example, but here in Carson as well where areas that are growing, how do you keep up with that growth, right? They're contacting us to build the brand new road, so Google doesn't have it on the map yet. But the county assessors uh, still may not have the brand newest of the new, which we can uh, track down in other ways, but uh, this gives us authoritative data that's official because as much as uh, many people rely on Google and other map providers, that data is not authoritative because it's not official coming from the counties. So that's what we're looking for to help us do our job better at the call center. Very common among other states in the nation to get support from state agencies to have official map data provided to them, just FYI. Thank you. And with that, Mr. Chair, we'll uh, stand for questions. And thank you for that. Members, any questions? Senator Daly, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for the presentation. You answered a couple of my questions. I was looking for, I found the definition for association of operators, and I knew that many uh, underground utilities, pipelines, and various things are called operators, but uh, you explained uh, uh, what, where the definition of operator was. So my question, I just want to be clear, is that we're allowing this information to be sent to the association of operators, so the, the call before you dig uh, people. Just wanted to be clear that each individual operator is not going to automatically have access to this, only what you would disclose to them or give them the most accurate information if you get a call. So the database isn't going to be out there to every, or the data set is not going to be out there to every operator except what they specifically need that you give them when they call in uh, for location. For the record, James Wingate, and I realized I forgot to spell my name. That's J-A-M-E-S-W-I-N-G-A-T-E. -E. Uh, correct, Senator Daly. That data set will not be distributed. Uh, what we do is only send the location of the digging to the utility operators that are affected. So um, Assemblyman Gurr mentioned there are 205 operators in Nevada that participate with us. There's an average of about seven utility operators per locate request. When someone says they're digging, there may be more if you're talking on Las Vegas Boulevard versus a very rural area in the Ruby Mountains, for example. There may be none in that location, but we only send to the utilities that are affected, and it's geofenced uh, to the location where the digging will take place. The full data set will never be available to any other parties, only our call center. And, and I appreciate that. That was just what I wanted I, to get on the record. That's the way I understood it. Just wanted to be clear. All right. Can I follow thank, up for thank just you. a second? Sure. Uh, I don't know if you had the information, but we had a friendly amendment from NACO. Oh, sorry. Bert, Assemblyman Gurr for the record. 
Thank you, Chair. We had a friendly amendment from NACO to specifically make sure that no employees could transfer that data out. Legal on our committee in government affairs said it was already in the law, so we dropped the, the amendment, or we would have had it here. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any additional questions? I don't think we have any. Uh, oh, Vice Chair, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Assemblyman, for presenting the bill. It seems super important. Mr. Wingate, I'm sorry to be so technologically ignorant. Um, you mentioned that that information is sent out to the contractor and it's geofence, and I kind of understand that, but can you explain how somebody who shouldn't have that data wouldn't get it because of that? Because I'm not 100% sure I'm understanding that. James Wingate, uh, USA North 811, for the record. So. A little history might be helpful. So um, in the 1970s, utility operators were expanding utilities dramatically, and they realized they're cutting each other's lines. For example, um, let's take Southern Nevada as an example. Envy Energy, uh, or formerly Nevada Power, uh, might cut a f uh, phone cable owned by what is today CenturyLink or Lumen, uh, and vice versa. And so they said, how can we stop this? Let's try to coordinate. And so it started as a voluntary association of utility operators, and then others said, oh, this is a good idea, let's coordinate. And eventually it became the law, and then it became the law to require excavators to contact the association. So the whole goal is you don't want the excavator guessing which utility operators are there. If you're working in your own, in your own yard, you might have an idea of what underground utilities are there because you know who you pay your utility bills to, right? But if you're a contractor that gets hired to work in a different location or turn a uh, vacant field into a new subdivision, how do you know what utilities are there when there are 205 separate ones? So the goal is they all cooperate to fund one call center, but we want it to be as efficient as possible and not waste the time. If somebody says they're digging in uh, Assemblyman Gurr's area in Elko, we don't need to notify City of Las Vegas, for example, right? Because it's way out of their area. So each utility operator in the background, if you can picture Google Earth on steroids, where there's a whole bunch of layers on top of that. Each utility operator says, I want to know about digging in this area, and but not over there. I don't care about this. My utilities are here. I only want to know about digging here. So when someone contacts us to dig, we draw a shape on the map that we call the dig site polygon, polygon meaning just many-sided shape. And if it overlaps the uh, area that um, Wingate Water Company provided, then Wingate Water Company is going to get that document that we call the ticket, telling them that uh, GER excavation is going to be digging there. So then Wingate Water can send their technicians out to paint the lines and avoid them being damaged. So um, it's all uh, using geographic information systems in the background, but the parcels will help us to draw the dig site polygon correctly so that we don't over notify utility operators and don't accidentally miss utilities. Unfortunately, the worst case scenario from my perspective is we think the digging's happening here, so we draw it on the map here and notify these utilities in this area, but really the digging's happening here and we don't notify these utilities and there is a high pressure pipeline there. The excavator shows up there to dig, he sees no marks, he thinks there's nothing there, he hits the pipeline, he's dead and I'm liable. That's worst case scenario. But unfortunately, that exact scenario has happened, not to us, but to a different 811 call center. So the, the whole goal is to have the most current map data available so that we are being accurate and precise with the notification to help, uh, help the process be as efficient and, and safe as possible for the public. Thank you very much, Mr. Wingate. It sounds like being air traffic controller, but with uh, a, lot of, a lot of dangerous underground lines. Thank you, Chair, for indulging me. S Senator Daly. And uh, thank, thank you, Madam Chair, or Mr. Chair, excuse me. Uh, just one more uh, uh, deal to help uh, uh, my colleague here. None of that still addresses the legacy issues of unrecorded lines and various things you still have those issues because I've seen it plenty of times happen unfortunately um, so we have a lot of stuff before we started putting this in that's in the ground especially in older communities uh, so a lot of legacy uh, lines and various things that uh, are not recorded but we've done a much better job uh, in recent decades and thank you with that I'd like to invite you both to sit back now invite those wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 177 
to please come forward, either in Carson City or Las Vegas. Seeing none in Las Vegas, we'll start here in, La in Carson City. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Stacy Woodbury, and I'm the manager of public affairs at Southwest Gas Corporation. We are uh, an operator as defined in statute, and we are a member of USA North. Last year in uh, Nevada, we processed over 153,000 dig tickets, with 82% of those being in Clark County. We appreciate the service provided by USA North and understand the need for very accurate uh, parcel data to mark those lines and avoid damages to critical underground for infrastructure, sorry. And for those reasons, we support AB 177. Thank you. And thank you for joining us, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, for the record, Jennifer Berthium, that's B-E-R-T-H-I-A-U-M-E, -E, uh, Government Affairs Manager at the Nevada Association of Counties. NAIC goes in support of AB 177 as it is a means to share accurate uh, parcel data sets with an association of operators in an efficient and confidential manner. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Uh, BPS, do we have anybody wishing to join us over the phone in support of Assembly Bill 177? If you would like to testify in support of AB 177, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Good afternoon, Chair Flores and committee members. My name is Chloe Chisholm, C-H-I-S-M. Government Relations Advisor for ND Energy. ND Energy is in support of AB 177. This bill prioritizes the safety of our employees and the community and is aligned with our damage prevention strategies by better protecting underground utility infrastructure. We supported this bill in the assembly and just wanted to put those brief comments of support on the record in the Senate as well. Thank you for your time. And thank you for joining us. Next caller in support of, of Assembly Bill 177. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. Next, we'll go to those wishing to testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 177, Carson City or Las Vegas. Seeing none, BPS, do we have anybody wishing to join us in opposition for Assembly Bill 177? If you would like to testify in opposition of AB 177, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. And we'll stay on, on the phone. Those wishing to testify in the neutral position for Assembly Bill 177. If you would like to testify in neutral for AB 177, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. Anybody in Carson City or Las Vegas wishing to testify in the neutral position? Seeing none, any closing remarks you may have. With that, thank you, Assemblymember, for your presentation. And with that, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing on Assembly Bill 177, and we'll move to our final bill presentation, which is Assembly Bill 214. Take care. Welcome, Assemblywoman. Assemblywoman, you're keeping, you're the only person keeping everybody from their Cinco de Mayo celebration. You got to remember that. <laughs> okay, Whenever so, you're ready. <laughs> uh, good morning, good afternoon. We'll make this as quickly as possible. You guys can just uh, amend and do pass right away if you like. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much for having this hearing today. My name is Natha Anderson, N-A-T-H-A, -A, Anderson, A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. It is my honor and pleasure to be the assembly member uh, from Assembly District 30, the heart of the Truckee Meadows. Um, I'm here today with the president of Northern Nevada Central Labor Council, Ross Kenson, um, president, uh, the former president, Mike Pilcher, and president of Teamsters Local 533, Gary Watson, to present AB 214. You should have in front of you some amendments, a whole three, I think. If not, I do have them 
as well, if I can ask the, I'm sorry, there are four now. Oops, excuse me. So one of these amendments literally just happened an hour before um, the, the committee uh, started. And so I wanted to thank Senator Gokachia for, for agreeing to sign on as a co-sponsor of this language. As this is being handed out, I'll kind of go through a few things because, again, I understand the importance of Cinco de Mayo celebrations. Uh, the ideas presented here today have been brought forward from Northern Nevada Labor Council and Teamsters Local 533 due to the treatment the bus drivers, as well as some of our riders, have experienced in Northern Nevada. When I presented this language in March, uh, just a few, was that just two months ago? Wow, it feels like longer. The discussions between uh, Regional Transportation Commission of Washoe County and Southern Regional Transportation Commission and our Labor Council of, of both areas, they were a little bit tense. They were a little bit, um, at times, it, it felt a little bit people were not agreeing with each other. But the process worked. And the process of legislation necessary to come forward with language that works for everybody. It worked. And the reason why it worked, people listened to each other. We heard the concerns from both sides. And we were able to take some items out and add some items in. And so, as an educator, as many of you know, that's what I am. I proudly stand in front of you today to say that our process works, and this bill is a pure sign of that. I would like to uh, thank Mike Hillerby of Northern Nevada RTC, Angela Castro and David Clyde of Southern Regional Transportation Commission, and Fran, Fran Almarez, as well as the gentleman joining me today, for all the work, candor, and ability to find a common good to clean up this language. The bill that I'm bringing forward does two things. The first, it creates an advisory committee for Washoe County, similar to what it happens in Clark County, to provide information and advice to the commissions concerning matters related to public mass transportation. This time in Washoe County, we do not have that. And the employers, employees excuse me, felt that their voice was not always being heard. The language being brought forward would allow for that to happen. The second item that's being brought forward clarifies the maintenance, use of audio and or video recordings, as well as providing the employee organization with these items in a timely fashion. This was probably both the largest area of uh, discussion, as well as the area where both sides saw the importance of being honest with each other and how this would, would be utilized. So in front of you, you've got the amendment, again with those three small items. The first, Again, I wanted to thank Senator Gokachia for adding, adding um, his name on to, as a co-sponsor. The second is when we took a look at the language, there was a realization that uh, Section 1.5 was repetitive. And instead, used the language from Section 3 and simply changed the population from the current 700,000 to 100,000 or more. So that way, it truly was consistent across both counties. The goal of this advisory committee, which is again lined out uh, who would be appointed, how they would be appointed, et cetera, as well as the availability of the recordings, is to help with the safety issues of our transit system. The issue of safety has been a huge concern across our state and across our nation. Uh, I think many of us already know about the incident that took place in March in uh, Clark County, where a single bus driver and a single passenger. That was all that was on the bus. The bus driver was attacked, and the two police officers, as well as the dog, um, that did show up, they were also attacked. This is what our drivers go through, and this is a way to start, to start, and I wanna make sure that's clear, start to address the issue, so that both the riders, as well as the workers, recognize that we see how important safety is on these transit system. I uh, thank you again for this opportunity in presenting the language on a Friday. So I tried to do it as quickly as possible. Um, but I'm more than happy to attempt the answer, to answer the questions. Or if you like, I can also go through the bill a little bit more if you'd like me to. Um, luckily, I do have some phone of friends, uh, both next to me and behind me, 
but again, more than happy to answer any questions as you see fit. <clears throat> and thank you for that presentation. Uh, members, any questions? Uh, Vice Chair, please. Thank you, Chair. And it's more of a comment. As some of Anderson, I appreciate you bringing the bill and working on rider safety. You know, I've been lucky enough to have served a uh, long time, served with your dad, who I held in very high esteem. And, you know, it's very rare to see legislation about safety uh, for public transit. So I really appreciate the bill. My dad had, um, used to drive a car. You know, I've lost him now for almost three years, but he... Uh, you know, used to own a car when he lived in Colorado, and at some point he decided to give it up, and he rode the buses all the time. Down in Las Vegas, he rode the buses. And for the most part, he's pretty safe, but it did tell me about a lot of stories sometimes that, that scared me, scared me, to, you know, for him to be a bus rider. So I appreciate what you're doing for the, the employees and for all the other riders. So just more of a comment. Thank you for indulging me, Chair. Members, any additional questions? Senator Guaycachia, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I just wanted to make sure I was at least on one bill with uh, Senator Daly before my career ended. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for the presentation, and thank you for joining us on a Friday. Uh, with that, I'd like to invite you to sit back, and I'd like to invite those wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 214 to please come forward, Carson City or Las Vegas. Welcome. For the record, my name is Mark Ellis. I'm the President of Communication Workers of America, Local 9413. We support this bill. Thank you. Please. Thank you, Chair Flores and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Susie Martinez, and I am the Executive Secretary Treasurer of the Nevada State AFL-CIO. And on behalf of over 150,000 members and 120 unions, we are in full support of um, this bill. And um, I'd just like to remind everybody, I hope everybody has a weekend. And um, the week, uh, how do we get the weekends? The unions, they brought you the weekends. So everybody enjoy and have a happy single day, Mayo. Thank you. And thank you for joining us, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Michael Hillerby on behalf of the Regional Transportation Commission of Washoe County. Here to support the bill, we want to thank the Assemblywoman and our colleagues in labor who she introduced earlier for working so hard on this, being able to address uh, the safety of both our drivers and the passengers. It, uh, it has been uh, a really kind of a pleasure getting here some work, but we're at a point where we've got a good bill in front of you, I think, and are uh, pleased to support it. Again, thank her very much and our other colleagues for working so hard. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Seeing no one else in support, BPS, do we have anybody wishing to join us over the, over the phone in support of Assembly Bill 214? If you would like to testify in support of AB 214, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Liz Sorensen. I'm the president of the Nevada State AFL-CIO, and I'm here today in strong support of AB 214. I urge this committee to support AB 214 as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us. Next caller in support. Good afternoon, Chairman Flores and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Mike McGovern. M-C-G-O-V-E-R-N. I strongly urge the committee to support Assembly Bill 214. I regularly use uh, the transit system here in Las Vegas and anything we can do to support the transit workers and people like myself that deserve safety on the transit system. Uh, I greatly appreciate you guys taking that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller in support. Good afternoon, Chairman Flores and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Dion Klug, D-I-O-N-N-E-K-L-U-G. I am with the United Food and Commercial Workers Union Local 711 in Las Vegas, and we strongly urge the committee to support AB214. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Next caller in support. Good 
my name is Ricky Bottleman, and for the or for the record, my name is Ricky Bottleman, and I strongly urge the committee to support Assembly Bill two one four. And thank you for joining us. Next caller in support. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Flores and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Amanda Nelson. I strongly urge the committee to support Assembly Bill 214 to help protect our transit workers. Out of all of our transit workers, I would like to mention only two. One of them has been spat on, punched in the face, and physically assaulted right in front of a security officer. The other one has had his windshield and windows broken on two separate occasions and been sprayed with glass. We need more protection for our transit workers. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Next caller in support. Good afternoon, Chairman Flores and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Robert Sumlin, R-O-B-E-R-T-S-U-M-L-I-N, and I'm with the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers. I support this legislation because our transit workers deserve to feel safe in their day-to-day -day jobs. I strongly urge the committee to support Assembly Bill 214. Thank you, and have a great single de Mayo. And, and thank you for joining us. Next caller in support. Good afternoon. My name is Edward Goodrich, E-D-W-A-R-D-G-O-O-D-R-I-C-H, representing the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees in Reno, Nevada. I want to thank the chair and the members of the committee for hearing this bill. I'll keep it simple today. Public transportation needs to be safe. We are in full support of AB 214 and strongly urge the committee to approve this bill. Thank the committee for its time. And thank you for joining us. Next caller in support. Public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. We'll stay on the phone. Is there anyone wishing to testify in opposition? If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 214, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Anyone in opposition here in Carson City or Las Vegas? Seeing none. BPS, do we have anybody in the neutral position for Assembly Bill 213? The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. 214. <laughs> I'm changing the bill number. Um, anybody wishing to testify in the neutral position here in Carson City or Las Vegas? Seeing none, Assemblywoman, any closing remarks? She gave me the hand gesture that the bill is perfect. Amend and do pass. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> With that, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing on Assembly Bill 214. The only remaining item on our agenda is public comment. BPS, do we have anybody wishing to join us over the phone for public comment? There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Thank you. Anybody wishing to join us for public comment here in Carson City or Las Vegas? Seeing none, thank you all. I know uh, it's a Friday, but our intent is for us not to meet next Friday so that you can all enjoy, uh, if you have the, the privilege of, of your mom and or your moms and your family. So that was the purpose of meeting today. Uh, we'll, have, uh, we'll be meeting on Monday. This meeting is adjourned.